Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Yang Chen. I'm a professor at the School of Information at the University of Michigan. So I'm here to discuss experiment design and analysis. And so we'll go through this course in about four weeks. So the first lecture is an introduction to experiments. We will uh, go through the basic concepts. And we'll first talk about what are experiments and why we want to conduct experimental research given the abundance of naturally occurring data. We'll also talk about experiment design, some of the brief, uh, the sort of basic concepts in experiment design. Then we will go through two papers. One is the foundation for lab experiments, and we'll talk about induced value theory by Vernon Smith in 1982. The other one is an analysis and a, a framework for field experiments by Harrison and List. Then the last topic is online field experiments, or sometimes in tech industries it's called A-B testing, and we will go through a paper by Chen and Constant. So let's first go through the definition of experiments and why we want to conduct experimental research. So there are many different definitions of experiments, but the most important feature of an experiment compared to, let's say, naturally occurring field data is that the experimenter has a lot of control when she designs or runs an experiment. And it is a consensus among experimentalists that there are, and, and empirical researcher, that there are no other empirical method which allows a similar type control as do experiments. One of the features in experimental design and implementation is the procedure of randomization. So we will go through various methods for randomization. And an important feature about randomization is that selection bias can be entirely removed when individuals or groups of individuals are randomly assigned to the treatment or the control group. So let me first elaborate on the control part. Uh, how is it that experimentalists get to have better control over the data that's generated? Uh, this is through varying certain variables uh, in an exogenous fashion while keeping everything else constant. And so as an experimenter, you know whether variables are exogenous or endogenous and you can isolate the possible causal relationships. So let me first define, here's a little footnote, on what is considered exogenous versus endogenous. An exogenous variation is a variation that the study participants cannot control. So for instance, this year there's a lot of rainfall, and that's something that we as decision makers cannot control. Uh, in comparison, an endogenous variable is uh, something that the decision maker can control. So I can decide whether to join a team or not, or I can decide whether I want to be an Uber driver, or uh, how much I want to drive if I join Uber. And those are called endogenous variables. So in an experiment, uh, an experimenter can First, know which variables are endogenous versus exogenous. Second, you know, through careful experimental design, isolate the possible causal relationships. A second part about better control is that the experimenter controls the information decision. And so, you know, the experimenter can decide how much information to release to the participants. And this is also important for replication. And the third part about control is that participants are randomly assigned to conditions. So whether you are in the treatment group or the control group is not controlled by you, but by a randomizing device controlled by the experimenter. So through randomization, we can eliminate the selection bias. And we're going to discuss more about the selection bias using examples. As a result, when you get experimental data, if it is carefully designed, you will need simpler econometrics or data analysis methods. So more about better control. So the experimenter can observe variables that are often not observable in the field. So when you look at eBay data, you cannot observe 
the maximum willingness to pay uh, from the bidder. But in a lab experiment, you can. More control also means that the researcher can calculate the predicted equilibrium exactly. And you can observe both equilibrium and non-equilibrium behavior. You can also observe equilibrium dynamics, you know, how fast or slow people converge to the equilibrium prediction. So later on, we'll actually use an example of first price auctions to first theoretically compute the equilibrium. And then we're going to give you a data set as part of your homework assignment. So you can look at how people behave and whether it conforms to the theoretical prediction. So the next topic um, about why we use experimental methods is the idea of being able to isolate causal relationships. So we say that A causes B rather than A just you know, correlate with B. There has to be a number of conditions which enables us to make these conclusions. The first condition is that the two variables have to be correlated, so they co-vary. And the covariation between the two variables is not spurious or um, they're not random. Thirdly, there's a logical time order, so A must precede B in time. And lastly, again, we're going back to the role of theory that theoretically we know that a mechanism is available that explains how an independent variable causes a dependent variable. So let me go through each of these points. One, the first point is uh, extremely important, which is correlation is not causation. We often observe two variables co-vary, and that let us conclude that these are correlated. But correlation is a necessary but not sufficient condition for causation. So for example, we observe that countries with a high rate of infant diarrhea also have bad road conditions. But we know from common sense and from data that, you know, bad road conditions cannot possibly cause uh, infant diarrhea or vice versa. So these are correlated, but there's no causal relationship between these two observations. Uh, the third part, the third aspect is spuriousness. So for A to cause B, the covariation between the two variables should not be spurious. So what would be a spurious correlation? Uh, one example is that ice cream sales are highest in the city when the rate of drowning in city swimming pools is also highest. So in this case, the high temperature is the common variable and ice cream sales does not cause drowning or vice versa. Um, the third aspect that there has to be is that there has to be a time order, a logical time order between A and B. So A, if for A to cause B, A must precede B in time. So for example, I kick the table and hurt my toe, then kicking the table precedes hurting my toe. And um, this gives us a plausible time order which says that kicking the table is the cause for hurting my toe. So the last part is the role of theory. So a good theory, it could be mathematical or not, it provides a mechanism which explains how an independent variable causes a dependent variable. There are several roles for theory, even though this is about experiments, experiment design and analysis. So the role of theory is that theory explains facts. Uh, theory can also make predictions. Uh, oftentimes, these predictions are quite precise. And the last part is theory formalizes intuition. So implied in all of these is the idea of confounders or lurking variables. So when we design an experiment, we want to make sure that there are no confounders. So what is a confounder? A confounder is a variable that influences both who is selected for the treatment and the outcome of the experiment. Another more common definition is that a confounder is a variable that influences both the dependent variable and the independent variable, causing a spurious association. So here is an example. 
Um, so the question is, does SAT preparation course courses improve SAT scores? If you just look at the correlation, uh, the answer is positive. So in this case, SAT preparation courses is one factor. Uh, it's the uh, independent variable, we call it x. Uh, SAT scores is the outcome variable that we call y. But if you think deeper about this relationship, you will realize that there are unobserved factors which predict SAT scores that are also correlated with taking a prep course. What are some of these? One example is family wealth, right? So this, this uh, rich families are able to provide their kids with um, SAT prep courses. They're uh, able to pay for the tuition but they might also provide other resources that would help improve SAT scores. So in this case, we say family wealth, which is this Z variable, is a confounder because it is positively correlated with both X and Y. So experiments can be a solution to the problem of unobserved confounders. In experiments, let me first define some of the terminologies that we often use. We say that there is a, usually a treatment group, or at least one treatment group, and at least one control group. And these terms come from medicine. So when you're in a control group, you take a pill which has no active ingredients, whereas if you're in the treatment group, you take a pill that contains the active ingredient that um, medical doctors might want to study. So in the generic experiment, we also use the same terminology, the treatment group versus the control group. So one thing that experiments can do is random assignment. So subjects are randomly assigned to treatment or control conditions that help generate statistically equivalent samples. And these can all be tested. We'll talk about examples uh, later on on how you might test whether the random assignment gives you, equi you know, statistically equivalent samples in the control and the treatment group. So going back to the SAT example, if we use random assignment, if this can be done, then we will ensure that you know subjects or students taking SAT prep courses versus those who are not given SAT prep courses uh, are randomly assigned, which means that if you look at the distribution of family wealth, you will have the same distribution in the control group and the treatment group, which resolves the issue of confounding. 